you here with uh, with Reality Sandwich. Um, this is awesome, man. Uh, I was just taking a look at uh, look at some of your content, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited for for the conversation today. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm a little a little nervous, but you know, looking forward to it. I am. I'm always excited for these because the like the intent and the heart behind this platform, at least, is really giving you know hopefully a that container that breeds a little bit of that vulnerability and uh, you know sharing a little bit of that little bit of the humanity uh, that you know kind of medicines and psychedelics and just kind of some some things that all dive into the the altered states of reality or altered states of consciousness and. You know, everyone's got their own, their own spin on that and their own experience. And I just, I just love hearing the stories. So I'm, you know, I'm usually a little, little fly on the wall. Um, you know, at least to, at least to start, I want to, you know, usually kick it over and, you know, I always, I always like sending it over, um, to you and just kind of prepping for, you know, um, to kind of hear, you know, like maybe like a pivotal moment and pivotal experience that you've had. And then it kind of, you know, we'll kind of spin off that, but if there's a, you know, a, a really transformative experience that you've, that you've had, I know we'll probably talk about um, some of your experience and story with, uh, with MDMA, LSD mushrooms. Um, but if there's something kind of that catalyzed a transformation in your life, like would love to just give you the floor to, to talk about that experience, you know, a little bit of the, the set and setting where you're, you know, where you're at coming into that and, what that experience was like and yeah there was yeah, there was an event that like talk about everything else yeah there was an event that kind of triggered it that was not psychedelic related but it sent me down that path a little bit so um so yeah sweet yeah yeah give it to us we're ready okay um yeah so about five years ago i moved to austin um grew up in the south my whole life very grew up southern baptist very traditional um I'm 53, so, you know, very conservative, just this kind of stuff was not talked about. Um, you didn't talk about much of anything really other than sports and religion, and that's about it. <laughs> so, um, bounced around from a bunch of jobs. When I came to Austin, uh, for some work with a, a, a company, um, after I was here about a year, I hired a coach. Now the coach wasn't in Austin, but they were in the UK and it was right at the start of the pandemic. So we were doing a zoom meeting and I remember this coach just looked me in the eye and looked through my soul from across the pond and just like, he said, Sean, your entire faith and your entire life is based on fear. And something about the way she said it just, just hit me like nothing had ever hit me before. So I don't know, you know, I don't know if she had some Reiki going on and threw it across at me or like, I don't know what happened, but I was like, no, that that's not true. That can't be true. And, you know, it kind of irritated me, triggered me a little bit. And then I, so I got off the phone and then like an hour later, I was over the edge of the bathtub, just throwing up because I was so sick from this realization that, oh my gosh, she's right. I had to lay down. I took like a four hour nap <clears throat> after that. And that moment kind of started my journey of look of just complete deconstruction, questioning everything, being more open to, you know, psychedelics and everything else. That's, that was the, just that one little phrase. <laughs> was that the first time you'd met this, this person, yeah. this coach? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was intense. So. Um, so yeah, that was, and at that point I had never done, you know, never done any type of psychedelics, had never even smoked marijuana. Um, alcohol is about the only thing I'd had in my entire life. Um, so but from there, it, it just cascaded, um, started questioning things. And I was in it with a group of people where I work that in here in Austin, it's, it's obviously not legal here, but it's the community here is pretty open um, around these, these topics. So, uh, there was a group of people, we, they offered, um, an MDMA It was kind of a group of us and somebody had some MDMA and I was like, I don't know what that is. Like, 
or whatever. I was like, okay, I'll try it, but please don't tell my wife I'm doing this. <laughs> did the, did the coach introduce you? No, to this, this was a, kind of this, this was actually the people I, I, um, I was working with. Okay. So people that you were working with, you know, so you, so you're, you'd met with the coach and I had that catalytic moment yep. and then, you know, and then people that you're working with are introducing you to some of these, you know, some of these medicines, some of these psychedelics. And because of the conversation with the, with the coach at the time, you were maybe more open to exploring these things. Right. A little bit more open. Okay. Um, and yeah, the first, the first time I, I did MDMA, I don't even know how much it was. It wasn't much, but it was a group setting. So then there's a lot of conversation. It wasn't like a super, um, therapeutic set and setting, but it wasn't, we weren't dancing and raving either. So it was just kind of a calm, mellow. So I was like, ah, nothing happened. And then the next day I was just an emotional, I was just all over the place emotionally. Um, just very, just my emotions were up and I, I've always been a very closed down guy. So that was to not be able to control that, to not be able to keep that was just, it was pretty wild. I was like, oh my God, something did happen. When you say kind of group setting, um, so was, was there someone like facilitating this group? Those was... No, it was kind of a, I think everybody there had done it before. So they were all kind of familiar with it. Um, so it was very just casual. It was more kind of a, almost like a team building exercise to like, just allow people to open up, hang out, that kind of stuff. So, which, you know, it wasn't a bad introduction, um, to the medicine as, as far as that goes, but I didn't understand the power of it or the potential of it at that time. Um, now, because I, I used to be a copywriter and I, I do a lot of research. So I started researching at that point, you know, I get the, uh, bought the trust to read to receive book, um, started doing all kinds of research into MDMA, into MDMA. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool stuff. Like, where's this been my whole life? You know, um, why aren't, why aren't people talking about this? Well, partly because I was in the circles that people don't talk about that kind of stuff. Um, so it's the reason I'd never heard of it. Um, so yeah, I ended up doing that, um, two more times over the next two years. And then recently, and we'll kind of jump back and forth, but, um, and recently I've started a protocol where I'm doing it about once every four to six weeks, um, solo, uh, I don't know if you've ever read the book MDMA solo. Personally, no. Yeah. So there's a book called MDMA Solo. I can't remember the guy's name that wrote it. Uh, it's a PDF. You can get it online for free. Um, and he has some reasons he recommends going solo. Um, so I, I was like, okay, I think I've done it enough times. I see, I know what it can do and how, you know, how I'm going to react to it. Um, I started doing that about three months ago and that's been it's been really good. Like I've, and also changed up the microdosing and integration in between as well a little bit. So that's, that's been a big, big plus as well. What were in the group setting, what were some of those conversations like? And I'm just, just trying to put myself in yeah, the, yeah. into that um, setting a little bit. So everyone, everyone, you know, is just kind of, Hey, we're here. This is a, this is a safe container. You know, we're going to, it wasn't that, yeah, it, yeah you, it, it's almost hard to remember. I mean, it's been, like I said, it's been almost four or five years ago, I guess now. Um, and I guess five years. And, um, I just remember I was at that time, it was still a fairly new group for me. And I've, I've always been one to observe more and not jump in to conversations, especially small groups like that. Um, and I was kind of the new guy in the crowd too, anyway. So I was really kind of just back watching, but I did notice myself a couple of times saying some things that I might not normally say that I would normally keep to myself, you know, like, um, like one person there, um, I'd noticed their interaction with their kids and things like that. And I was, I was like, you're a really good dad, man. Like you're just, you know, just that love was coming out, you know? And I was like, it's, it's something I wouldn't have normally said like that. And the way I said it, and I felt myself like, almost like tearing up and choking on it, you know, in my throat as I was saying it, cause it was so emotional, um, that I remember specifically, but other than that, I don't remember a lot of the, 
the conversations going on around at the time. Gotcha. Yeah. I feel like it would be just something that's opening up a little bit of the, like, like you just mentioned, you know, like a little bit of the vulnerability, right? Exactly. And, you know, a little bit of the empathy and compassion in and around the conversations to, to build those connections within the group. Yep. For sure. And, and as you're, as you're starting down this journey, are you still, are you still talking with the coach? Is that a, is that still part of it? Or is that just a one time? That was kind of a one time. I think I, I think I stayed on with the coach for like another couple of weeks. Um, but it was a small group setting, a different, totally different group, online group setting. And it just, it wasn't really the crowd for me, especially after that kind of revelation. I was like, like I got what I needed from that one call and I knew it was time to move on and, and kind of keep going forward. So I wasn't working with a coach. Um, I just kept researching this stuff and kind of getting a little bit more and more curious. Um, I didn't have access to any, um, really to anything. So as I could, um, uh, get someone to, you know, provide me with something, I did another. So one of the people in that initial group, um, they invited me to do a session by myself where they would sit with a much more, you know, set and setting, nice, quiet room, lay down. I shaved the whole bit. Um, so I did that and I remember, and that's really the first experience that I like really fully remember. Um, and that was very, for me, it was very, um, I was very talkative. Like, I felt like I talked nonstop I said I didn't, but it felt like that. <laughs> um, and I did, a, I was moving my hands a lot. I would roll my wrist a lot. I was really like my neck, move my neck a lot. So there's a lot of movement going on, uh, for me in that first kind of that first full dose setting. And I just remember talking a lot and I recorded the session and I even and I just dumped a lot of stuff. I don't remember all what I said, but I do remember I went back and listened to the session about a week later, kind of as part of integration because I had recorded it on my phone. And I was actually surprised at like how hard I'd been on myself during the session. So there was still a lot of like self shame and doubt and self worth issues coming up um, that just kept coming up throughout the session. Um, which I thought was interesting, was, uh, but that was starting to crack me open to this kind of low self-worth, low self-esteem thing that I've been carrying around for 50 years, you know, 40, 48, 49 years at that point. I didn't even know I'd been carried around. And just try if, if you're comfortable kind of diving into that a little bit more, what like, give me an example of that as far as what you said earlier, as far as living, living life in a, in a state of fear and reacting to things from that, from that standpoint, um, or, or the self-doubt, self-shame. I think everyone has a little bit of that inherent in their, in their human nature, but for you, how are you finding that manifest? What was that? What were some of those kind of tangible examples that you were that you were unpacking in your, in your daily life that you were finding. Yeah. And I, it's really accelerated, um, you know, more recently. So I can say now looking back, I mean, if you'd asked me this, even, you know, a year ago, I would have been able to give you the same answer, which we'll get to that. What happened one year ago, almost, I guess it was last October. So almost exactly a year ago. Um, but up to that point, I, I was just kind of start, starting to crack open, but looking back now, I could tell you that throughout my entire life, from the time I was born to now, I've moved every two to three years, new house, sometimes in the same city, sometimes across state, sometimes across the country. That was with my parents. And then I kept that going after I got married and just, so I was always in this state of kind of fight or flight, mostly flight. I really didn't ever. I didn't get the fight gene. I don't think <laughs> I got the, I, ten, I tend to do more of a, the flight and freeze than the fight. Um, and I started, as I was going through these, I would start seeing things that had happened in my childhood that I wouldn't call them trauma, but obviously they were big turning points for me. 
Um, one of those was I, I grew up, so my parents were divorced before I was, um, before I was two, I don't remember it and lived with my mom. And at age 10, so the end of third grade, I would go spend summers with my dad. And at the end of third grade, they sat me down and they asked me, who do you want to live with from now moving forward? And cause this was not an arrangement where they were like in the same town. And I spent two days at one and this was like, they were, you know, hours apart. And this was back in the eighties, early eighties. Um, and I remember skipping around the living room at my mom's house, trying not to cry because I knew that somebody was going to be disappointed no matter what choice I made. And that man, <laughs> that's a, that's a heavy thing to put on, put on a young child. Well, I'll tell you the, what though, what happened was through the MDMA experiences, and I don't remember exactly which one it was, but one of them, it might've been that, that the one we were just talking about, I replayed that in my head. And I'd, I'd kind of isolated that event before through some coaching and other stuff, but I, I'd never really, so intellectually, I knew that was a big deal, but I'd never felt that because I'd suppressed most of my stuff. Um, but I was able to go back and kind of in that moment and flip the script and say, look, because that's the same reaction everybody has when I tell that story. It's like, oh, that's tough to put on a kid. But when I go back and I replay it while I was on MDMA, I could see in that situation that what they were actually doing was giving me respect and authority to choose my own life. They appreciated me enough and they thought I was old enough and to decide for myself who I wanted to go with. That's what I saw going back in. And if I talk to my dad today, he, he agrees with that. My mom's passed away, but, um, and he had no idea that it, it affected me like that. I love little, little morsels like that of just how your perception of reality shifts a little bit like that. And all of a sudden the whole landscape looks a little different. Yeah. <laughs> looks a lot different sometimes. Yeah. But and it's, you know, it's like, I don't know. Was that it's true? Or is that, is it that now that my psyche feels safe enough and that it, it can rewrite that part of story? Um, either way it's rewritten, right? It's like the, the inside out movies, right? We've taken the core memory and we've, you know, taken the sad off of it. So that's, that feels like what happened. Wow. Oh, that is, yeah, that's a cool example. Yeah. And there, and there's appreciate, appreciate you sharing that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we can keep going. I don't know where you want to go next. Any, any part of the, any part of the story and the journey. Um, so we've, yeah, I'm bouncing around about, a little bit because yeah. in my head, it's all kind of the timelines are kind of all over the place, you know, cause you take care of some stuff and then you go back and kind of fix this thing that was back here and it kind of re reorient your whole timeline. You know, if you're, if you're into timeline therapy or anything like that, like that's, so it really, I don't want to sound like it's messed up my head or anything, but it really does feel like certain parts of the past have completely changed. It's just, it's just kind of wild. I'll just, I'll go I'm with a, this. I'm a fan of, yeah, I was going to say, I'm a fan of the idea that, uh, we created the as we created the aspect of time anyways, so right. time is only whatever we, uh, whatever we created it to be. So yeah, <laughs> feel free to feel free to give me your, your, uh, personal timeline there. Yeah. It's, um, oh man, I could talk forever about that. I, I kind of came up with this because I do coaching now. Um, and I kind of kind of came up with this, this whole technique just as part of my integration process. And I call it quantum soul smithing where I can go in and, and help people, um, like literally we, we can, it's a combination of inner child work, parts, integration work, timeline therapy, visualization. It's kind of all rolled into one and we can like rewrite your, your past and it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and that's without psychedelics. So it's pretty cool. Um, or either low dose, kind of a microdose can, can help that process for sure. Um, well, I'll do this. So about two years, two and a half years into this journey, 
because, you know, I've been, I've been suppressing emotions for so long or depressing emotions for so long that as I started doing this work, things start bubbling up, right? Just feelings that I've not felt before. And I start to get very depressed. And luckily I had a friend here who was going through some, something similar at about the same time. Uh, he's younger than me, but about the same time. So he was, he was kind of a, a good friend to have. And he, he decided he was going to get on, um, SSRIs, antidepressants. And I was like, I don't know, man, I can't, I can't do that. Like that's, you have to understand like where I, like where I grew up in the South, in the eighties, like if you were to say you were depressed, I mean, mental health wasn't talked about. And if you were to say you're depressed, it'd be like, just, you know, suck it up, buttercup, like, you know, run it off. You know, <laughs> it's like there was no mental health. Um, nobody talked about mental health. So I've always had this kind of aversion to, to anything like that. And, you know, it was kind of thought of as broken, faulty manufacturing type, you know, feel to it. Right. Um, and then you just push through it and, and work on it. So a big part of my journey, I was like, I, I booked a call with like one of the telemed doctors to talk about getting on antidepressants and blew off the call. Like I, w I didn't show up for the call. It's like, I can't do it. I'm not, I, I can't do it. And my friend, he was like, no, just look, just at least talk to the doctor. Like just talk to him. And I finally did it. And when I, when I got on the phone with the doctor and said, I think I might be depressed. As soon as I said that and admitted it out loud to myself, I felt a huge amount of that weight drop, like almost immediately, just, just by admitting that it was a possibility. But I was still like, okay, so, I was, you know, I was talking to the, I think it was a nurse practitioner. I was talking to her and um, she was like, I was like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think I really need this. And, you know, I'm probably, I'm probably not far enough along or bad off enough to need this. And she's like, that's exactly what depressed people say <laughs> that they think they aren't worth the treatment, which is basically what I was saying. You know, like, I don't think I'm bad enough, like give it to somebody else type thing. Um, scarcity, fear, all that was still running the show. So I finally agreed to do it. I'd done some research and I was like, all right, I'll give it six months because I've heard that if you get on antidepressants longer than six months, it could be really hard to get off and you get brain zaps and, and all this kind of stuff. So I get on it lowest dose you could get. And it did immediately like quiet the voices in my head. So I will say that, and it gave me some breathing room to, to where I could like think normally again. And I had no idea that my whole life I'd had just this negative, you know, critic in my head just for four decades. Like I, I just thought that's what everybody had. And when it stopped, it was like, I mean, it was just, the silence was just amazing. Like I didn't know what to do. Like it was, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, and I remember one night, cause one of the side effects can be a little bit of insomnia. And I remember about a weekend I was walking around the house, couldn't sleep. And like just a switch flipped and I literally felt my size for the first time in my life. I'd always felt smaller. Like I always felt like the smallest guy in the room and I'm not, I'm, I'm six, one, 200 pounds. Like I'm not small, I'm a pretty big guy. And, but literally the floor felt further away. I felt bigger. I felt like I took up space in the room and it was just like, wow, this is, this is surreal kind of stuff. But it didn't take long. It was about three or four months. And I realized this stuff was numbing me out after I kind of got that first thing. And very quickly it was starting to numb me, you know, highs and lows. It's like, I don't want this. I got to look for alternatives. Um, so I got off of that right at six months, weaned off. Um, and then I did another MDMA session. Um, and then we did about six months later, I did two Kana sessions, kind of uh, two nights in a row with a facilitator. And that was with a group of people as well. Um, 
And that was a very, that, that was kind of the same thing. Like I really didn't feel anything going on, but I remember the first night we had taken the Kana. Are you familiar with Kana? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So I remember we, we, I had taken the Kana, um, and I went outside. I don't, there was, there was one person that was there in the group and they were going through some divorce stuff. And like, it was really like, there was a lot of energy around it and people were like trying to consult. And I was like, I don't want anything to do with this. Like I'm, <laughs> that's not what I came here for. So I went out on the patio on the deck and I just sat on the chair and I got in like, um, meditation pose, you know, just sitting there, legs crossed. And I remember sitting there for about 15 minutes. I could feel it kicking in. And I remember getting really sad. I was like, why is nobody coming to check on me? Like, why, why am I like, I'm not worth being checked on. And like all this stuff started coming up, you know, just like, and I was like, this is ridiculous. Like nobody's checking on me and I was feeling sorry for myself and all this stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe I need to like take care of myself. Maybe I can take care of myself. Yeah, I can take care of myself. Like, it's nice to have people. I don't have to have somebody come. I'm fine. I'm breathing. I'm chilled out. I'm at a house on the lake. Like, life right now is pretty good. I've got the time and money to do this event. Like, why am I feeling sorry for myself? And that kind of, you know, unraveled some stuff that evening for the next, you know, 30 minutes or so. And then finally somebody did, one of the facilitators did come out. He was asking me how I went, how I was doing. And I was like, well, I said, honestly, about 20 minutes ago, I was, I was really upset that nobody was come to check on me. You're like, oh, I checked on you. I saw you out here, and I, but you look completely zinned out. So I didn't bother you. <laughs> so, um, and then we were talking, he's, you know, I've always been an intellectual guy and love ideas, love reading, love researching, love all that kind of stuff. And then when you get in this world, everybody's like, you got to get out of your head, get into your body. Right. And almost like the head, your head and your brain becomes the bad guy. I don't know if you've experienced that. Um, so yeah, I know it. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So I just was, I was like, oh, I was feeling guilty because I couldn't figure out how to get out of my head. And I was like, I don't even know what it means. Like, I don't know what you, you guys are crazy. I don't know what it means to like be in your heart or feel your body. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, these people would be like, oh, I can feel the energy coming from my third chakra. And I'm like, I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, it just did not compute to me at all. Um, so the facilitator, he's there and he's like, he's like, well. I mean, just pure Zen master, like he's like, maybe you've got a beautiful brain and it's just really powerful and it's, and it's there for a reason. And as soon as he said that and didn't try to, he basically gave me permission to be in my head and it let me out of my head. And immediately I was like, whew, like immediately I started to feel that like heart expansion when he said that and just, I was, I cried a little bit right there, smiled, kind of laughed. We laughed. Um, and that was kind of the biggest thing I got from that event. And we did two nights. And then the third day we did an integration that morning and that morning, man, I just, the floodgates opened and I was just like, I finally understood what people meant by, by like being able to feel your heart, your heart center. Mm -hmm. I felt it for the first time in my life. And I was like, oh, wow, this is what everybody's talking about. It's pretty cool. But I didn't, because of the way the facilitator handled that, I didn't make my head the bad guy. I, hadn't, I now had both, which I think is a powerful, powerful way to go. There's, and it felt like, feels like you're kind of starting to, to breach on a little bit of this theme so I don't, I don't want to prompt it too hard, but it just feels like, feels like you're touching on this notion, this theme that at least personally for me, I feel like becomes the very common thread in the fabric of all these medicines and, and in life is that notion of really understanding the art of letting go and the art of 
surrendering and, and, you know, kind of what you're alluding to there of, you know, Hey, they, like, I have this, you know, I have this problem that I see in this one way. And rather than, rather than trying to explain it away or like say that's wrong, instead the answer is yeah. And that's fine that it is, it is. And that is fine. And as, and as soon as, you know, you're, you're able to accept what is as it is, there's something that transforms inside of us in our soul or something that, that releases. And then all of a sudden everything clicks back into some, you know, into some, you know, call it the, the way that we were meant to be. <laughs> yeah, no, you're exactly right. And this will blow your mind when we get to this next part here. But, um, so after that kind of journey, you know, now I'm, I'm even more exposed, right? So the highs are higher and the, the facilitators warned me. Um, he's like, you're now going to experience higher highs, but you could very well experience lower lows as well because you're opening your emotional range throughout this process. And sure enough, the lows got lower and I kind of went back into kind of a depressed anxiety state, um, even suicidal over the next year. And so about what, why do you think that is like, why, you know, I'm just maybe kind of, yeah, I mean, I think before you get to the, the I do part, think it but, is the, know, I was experiencing these such a wider range of emotion than I'd ever felt in my life that I didn't know how to deal with the lower lows that were trying to come up and process. And I, I was, I, I was still fighting the whole, you know, what is right. I mean, I'd read mm -hmm. Byron Katie, uh, you know, I'd read all that stuff. So I knew intellectually, but I still hadn't, I still had not had the practice or enough practice yet with the actual processing of emotions to know what to do and how to do it. And, you know, it's something you kind of, you can get some guidance and some coaching, but until you kind of experience and do it yourself a few times and really learn to let it flow through, you know, um, I mean, yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday or even today, yesterday, I, I guided someone through a journey and it drained me just kind of being, you know, the sitter and on guard and guiding and all that stuff. So this morning I kind of woke up with a little bit of a hangover, even though I didn't have any medicine myself, I just felt kind of just drained and whatever. And before I would have been, been like made that wrong, all kinds of stuff today. I was like, well, I guess I'm gonna go take a nap, you know, went and took a nap, ate some good, I ate some good food. Um, and just, I just let it, let it process. I set aside the work that I had for the day. Um, and I just, I allowed it to process and now it's gone. Whereas before that could have derailed me for weeks or even months. I would just get in that spiral and that funk and just, you know, just kind of spiral. And now that doesn't happen. So. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's the, I, I like what you said there. Like the, the practice, I, it's funny. The, um, my intention, any, anytime, you know, I'm, you know, really going into a, you know, ceremonial setting or, you know, prayers and meditations is to continue practicing the art of letting go. And there's always, you know, there's always something, you know, whether it's, you know, your, you know, family relationships or, X, Y, or Z, you know, there's always kind of some underlining current, but no matter what, it's always comes back to that core, that core intention. And for me, at least, I always feel like that's the, you know, that's the point of it all is I'm, I want to experience this, you know, intense practice where I'm forced to, you know, go through the problem. You know, we spend life like, you know, trying to, you know, here's this rock and problem in front of us. I'm like, how do I get around this thing to get to the other side? And you know, whatever, whatever medicine, it usually seems like, again, that common theme is it's just going to like send you through it yeah. right through the middle. And, you know, you're, you're forced to kind of practice that. And I call it the art, you know, cause it looks different and however, you know, the art of letting go. And for me, that's how I feel like, you know, that's how it applies to my everyday life is, man, I've got a little bit of muscle memory now, you know, every time I go through that, I gain a little bit of muscle memory on what that feels like, you know, kind of what the, the, the head versus the heart, you know, how those, you know, finally hit their flow state together and how you are able to, oh, that's what that, 
That's what that muscle memory feels like to just let that go, you know, let that feeling go, let that thought go, you know, let this situation, you know, be as it is and, and, you know, yeah, uh, regulate yourself and, and move on. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. So yeah, to kind of pick up. So I, I kind of went back into kind of de into depression. I didn't do any more like, um, <clears throat> I didn't want to get on SSRIs again. And I'd heard about mushrooms and I was like, well, maybe I should try like, you know, a full dose of mushrooms and, you know, I've never done anything like that. So that was like a, that felt like a much bigger step from what I'd heard and things I'd read and things like that. You know, it's much more intense than obviously MDMA is super, super mild. And, uh, for most people, um, super comforting. And, you know, I knew that mushrooms could be more confronting. And I was afraid I still had this fear that I was going to go on mushrooms and I would get in my head and never come out and I would go psychotic. That was my fear going in, um, which is not a great state to go in, um, to mushrooms with. Um, but I found a buddy who had also never done mushrooms and we agreed to sit for each other. He would do one day and then I would do the other, you know, swap off. So he went first, he had a, he had a, you know, base pretty, you know, normal trip. He was there with the shade. We did the Johns Hopkins playlist. I'm asked the whole bit. Um, you know, he, you could see visibly he was going through the waves and the tough and the amazing, tough, amazing, just kind of waves came. Um, but he handled it really, really well. I think we did four grams. Um, so I, I do it the next day. I take the mushrooms and it hits fast. I'd be like 20 minutes. I'm starting to feel it. It, it hit really fast. Um, I had done. What are you feeling? Um, I'm feeling like just, uh, I usually for a long time, I felt it in my neck first, like just any type of drugs. I would feel it in my neck first. I don't, that doesn't happen anymore. I think I've released a lot of whatever was up there, uh, but just a lot of heaviness. And then it turned into, um, I was like, Oh, it just kind of a warmth all over my body. It's like, Oh, I think I'm gonna go ahead and lay down. So I lay down, we sync up. I had headphones on, but then we also had the Sono system in the house synced. So if you took the headphones off, you were still in the music, um, which was kind of a, a great idea. It turned out that was a very smart idea. Um, but so I put the headphones on, I put the mask on and I'm, you know, another 10, 15 minutes goes by and I'm starting to see visuals and I'm seeing like just this black background with maroon colored geometric, you know, shapes and stuff starting to kaleidoscope in and things like that. And I remember I was like watching them out here, like on a movie screen. And then all of a sudden, and I was kind of telling my friend about it. I was editorializing because that's what I do. And, um, and I was trying to, you know, almost trying to document the journey too. Um, and then all of a sudden I went from watching it to being in it. And that kind of freaked me out and I got real quiet. And I don't know how long I laid there, but I don't remember what it was, five or 10 minutes probably. And then all of a sudden I just get pure panic. Just, I rip off the eye shades, pull off the headphones. I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> and my friend was like, um, <laughs> you're doing it, buddy. So you're like, you're in it. This is it. And it was, it was at that kind of still onset. So I was starting to get a little bit of nausea. Um, he was starting to teleport from one side of the room to the other on me, you know, just that visual, like jumping. Um, and at that point, so I, I stand up, I'm like, I need to move. I need to walk. And this would be a theme for the rest of the trip. I just had this overwhelming amount of physical fear come up. And remember I was worried about being, in, being intellectually trapped, right? But the way it actually came out was physical fear, like full on shakes, anxiety, couldn't catch my breath. Um, 
the only thing that would would soothe it is I would have to like jump and just like bounce almost like you see some like tribal going around a fire jumping and you know I was um I was talking I was cussing I was like just like it came out very very physically and that went on for about an hour hour and a half two hours probably and I was like oh I think I'm I think I'm done <laughs> and I just remember sitting there looking at the clock. I was like, oh, that, that wasn't bad. I think I'm done. Why don't we go sit down? I sit down and I'm like, oh, here comes another wave. And I just ball up in like a fetal position on the couch. And I just laid there for probably, I don't know, another hour or so. Just kind of just trying to breathe, trying to calm down. Just, and the phrase that kept coming up and it matches what you said the phrase that kept coming up is the hardest part is letting go. And I just heard that over and over and over. It's like the hardest part is letting go. The hardest part is letting go. And that became my integration work after that um, for quite a while. Um, so the rest of the trip, I mean, the trip goes another. I think we started at like noon and I think the Final couple waves were probably around seven or eight that night. They got less and less and less. And they were more emotional and stuff at the at the end. Um, and I was absolutely felt like I'd been hit by a truck the next day. So we did it on Friday. Saturday, I felt like I was dead and buried. And then Sunday felt like resurrection day. And I felt like the best I'd ever felt in my life. Just, it was wild. And then since then I've been on, uh, so that was a year ago. And since then I've been microdosing with mushrooms and doing integration type work, uh, all kinds of stuff, journaling, shadow work, um, and just processing those emotions as they came up, as they continue to come up and just getting better and better and faster and faster, allowing them to just to flow through now. What does some of those practices look like over the last year? I mean, it, you know, journaling, everyone kind of has their own journaling practice, but just kind of overall integration and processing, you know, what does that look like on like a daily or a weekly basis for you? Yeah. So it's, um, regular meditation, not every day. Um, but almost every day so I'll do at least 20 minutes sometime during the day. Uh, I'm pretty intuitive. I don't, I'm not big on routines or stuff like that. So, um, sometimes I'll do it in the morning. Sometimes I'll do it at lunch. Um, I've started to really appreciate slow mornings. And what I mean by that is I used to get up, you know, I'd listen to a podcast or I'd listen to, um, an audio book and, um, you know, just try to be productive, like right off the bat. And now what I do, and I, and I think that was dr been being driven out of fear, you know, fear of not keeping up, fear of not having enough knowledge, fear of whatever. And now what I do, since my body has calmed down, it doesn't feel like it's, you know, running from, for its life anymore. Like I actually feel calm and safe and secure, even though some, you know, some s situations that were causing that haven't changed. Um, but now what I do is I, I'll make a, I make my coffee in the morning, French press, and I'll make two cups. So I make one in my Yeti that's, you know, sealed and it stays warm. And then I make one in a regular mug and I take that mug out on the front porch. I've got rocking chairs out there with no phone, no timer, no journal, no nothing, just the cup of coffee. And when I'm finished with a cup of coffee, I go back in. I just sit there and rock in the chair listen to the birds, the neighborhood, the lawn care guys coming by, like whatever. And I just sip on my coffee with no expectation or intention to do anything other than sip on my coffee. And I've been doing that for about three or four months now. And that has been as silly as that sounds. That's, that's been a game changer. Like that's just been super empowering that like, 
I'm in control of my day. I get to, I start it calm. And if you start your day calm, it tends to finish fairly calm. That's what I found. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little the same way, uh, especially recently trying to give the space in the container, no phone, no work. You know, there's, there's just so much that floods your awareness and your consciousness when you just look at that little screen for the first time and it, you know, everyone's different, but for me, I just I feel like there's the rest of the day for that. If you, you know, as soon as you start that, it's the spiral. It doesn't end until, you know, until the day ends or until do not disturb goes on or something. And so I'm that same way. If like, give me a half hour or whatever it is, you know, and it, it, every day is different. You know, some days you're, you know, you get up and your, your brain's ready for it and you're just going for it. But you know, most days try to try to respect some kind of, you know, routine and, you know, like there's, there's gotta be 10 things that, that I can do, you know, drinking a glass of water, like just all these things that are more important to get done and to, to put myself in a right headspace to, to like enter the rest of the day. Yeah. I was even finding, and I think a lot of people are, are starting to experience this, but you know, the kind of the biohacking fatigue, the morning routine fatigue, I was like, you know, you, you can make a pretty intensive checklist of all the things you should do to start your morning. Right. And I was like, what if I just stripped all that away? And I just went back 50 years in time and just had coffee <laughs> and that was it. You know, I mean, back then we would have read the newspaper, but you know, um, but you know, yeah, just no input, you know, just no input, no output, just waking up. I mean, there's some input, I guess, from nature and things like that. But usually I'll, I'll get on the porch. I'll step down in the yard barefoot. So do a little grounding, you know, let the sun hit me a little bit and go back up. And just, you know, it's usually about 20 minutes or so by the time I drink that, that little cup of coffee. And then I go in and start work. And it's just been, I just go into work just so much more. I work from home. So, um, but I just go in so much more grounded and centered and not frenetic. What do you think about breath work? Is that something that you are I did do, intentional about? You have a practice around? I don't have a practice around it. I'm not, uh, personally, I haven't enjoyed it at all. Um, and I'm trying to do more things that I enjoy and not force myself to do things that are unenjoyable right now. I did go th to, uh, was it Y Tally? I went to his event like two years ago here in Austin and that was pretty intense. That was, that was almost a psychedelic experience in itself for about two hours. Uh, it was very, very intense. I sweat through, um, I was wearing a sweatsuit and I sweat all the way through it. Like I was literally just, it looked like I jumped in a swimming, swimming pool and the room wasn't that hot. It was just stuff coming out, you know, just emotions and, screams and other stuff. So, um, but I, I tried a couple like breathwork meditations and things like that. And it's just other than like some slow breathing while I'm meditating, I don't really do any breath work. It just hasn't landed for me yet. Gotcha. And I don't Are do cold there plunges any... either. <laughs> no cold plunges. No. no. Yeah. That's I, something I'll, I'll do that every now and then a little, you know, just turn the shower on in the morning and, you know, hop in there like butt ass cold. And you're just like, well, I'm awake now. Yeah. I got my, I got my brain nerve endings firing. Yeah. And I just, I, again, I'm trying to just, I'm trying to be very kind to myself. Like I've run myself pretty hard most of my life out of fear. So now I'm just trying to be kind to myself and just enjoy the flow. It's like I've been going down a class five whitewater river for 50 years. And now I'm in a nice, long, calm stretch. And I'm just enjoying that right now. That's awesome. Is there any, are there any medicines that, that you feel like are in your near or short-term future? 
outside of the the ones mentioned here? Yeah. So so far, I think we we've, we've mentioned MDMA, Kana, and mushrooms. Um, so three months ago, when I started doing the MDMA solo, he recommends in that book to do some type of um, microdosing in between sessions, and he actually recommends LSD. I didn't have any, but I finally found a place where I could get some. And I started doing that. And I do it two day, I do 10 micrograms on Tuesday and 10 on Saturday. Um, and that has made a, that's been a really very different experience than mushroom microdosing. Like I noticed mushroom microdosing was more, it would bring up more emotions and the LSD just brings up a little, like, it just feels like a sunshine smiley face in my chest. Like, it's just, it just makes me happy. Um, and I'm like, really, it's funny because I used to not be able to feel anything in my body. Like we talked about earlier and now I'm super sensitive. Like I can really notice these things still not like some of the people that, you know, that, that seem to be in tune to like what their little pinky toes doing, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not there yet, but I can certainly now start to feel these medicines. And I'm also looking for it because that's just my personality and the research and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and now I've gotten my, my wife is on the same protocol now. Um, it's helped her tremendously. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I've looked at, um, Bufo, but I haven't done it yet, mm -hmm. but that's, if, if there was a new one to be introduced, it would probably be that, but I think I'm ready to do another mushroom journey again. Like it feels like it's awesome. It's been almost a year. It feels like, feels like it's time. And I, I'd be curious to see how different the journey might be this time. Have you and your wife journeyed together either? either just microdosing or, you know, heavier dose. Um, we have done MDMA together and actually, um, people love this. Everybody loves it when I tell this story. So my daughter moved out a year ago. Um, she's 23, 24. Um, and she was moving across the country and I was like, we should do MDMA before you leave as a family. So the three of us, to air anything that needs to like anything that needs to be said. We don't want anything left unsaid. Like let's, let's do this. And my daughter had never done anything like that. My wife had never done anything like that. So this was my fourth, fourth or fifth time at that point. Um, so yeah, we all, we all did a dose of MDMA and, uh, everybody was kind of doing their individual thing the, for the first dose. And then when we did the booster dose, we all kind of just talked and it was great. It was amazing. And I, I can't think of a better way to, to send off your, your kid. And actually she's coming home, um, next month and we're going to do it again. So amazing. You find, you find that that, that was bringing about any healing experiences or just a, just a nice, you know, like end of a chapter kind of send off type of yeah, you know, type I, of energy or I think it was like, I don't, nothing really like groundbreaking was like said, or it wasn't like something big was resolved or anything like that. Um, we had been, been pretty good. Um, but I think it was the fact that we created the space for it and we're willing to do that is is, was as much the magic as the medicine in, in that particular case. Um, you know, that we were willing to provide that experience, I think meant a lot to my daughter and, um, and we did talk, I, you know, how it is with this stuff. Sometimes you don't remember what actually happened on the, like, it's not like you're blackout, but it is just kind of, it's hard to remember exactly what all was said and what wasn't. You kind of yeah. you walk away with the feeling, but you don't walk away with all the details mm -hmm. for sure. At least I don't. We're going to have to circle back after the, uh, after the Bufo. Yeah. <laughs> Get that experience. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, yeah. I found a church, you know, up here that does that here in outside of Austin. So, um, so yeah, well, I don't know. That's, 
that's a, from what I understand, a short, intense ride. So, um, mm -hmm. I think they do the combo before as well, which to help clear out and all that kind of stuff. So, whoa, baby, yeah, uh, the combo, man, that is, whew. yeah, um, that's a that's a much different, uh, yeah, that's an intense process. They don't, you don't have to do it, but they they recommend it because they say it helps clear out the channels and all that kind of stuff to kind of flushes your system out. I was like, I've seen, I mean, I watched a couple of videos on combo and I was like, that looks like when I was in, in the army and basic training <laughs> and we went to the gas chamber and like had to go get <laughs> tear gas sprayed on us. That's exactly what it looks like. I was like, I've done that. Yeah. You're damn right. <laughs> so I was like, I don't, yeah, none of it looks fun. Right. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's the, the journey for me. Maybe I'll just skip that part. So. Maybe I'll just do it fast for three days instead. So, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I'm going to give you, give you some awesome gratitudes here for, for sharing some of your journey, but I was feeling, I was feeling on my heart. One more, one more question to kind of close with and, you know, just kind of give you space and, in, in a container. Um, if there's anything on your heart that you want to manifest, you know, and I know something that you said that I, that I love as well as, you know, you said, once I, you know, once I said this out loud, you know, I think you said, you know, once I admitted, you know, that I was, that I was depressed, like this whole weight came off my shoulders. And I, I think that is a huge part of setting intentions and, and manifestations is declaring, you know, declaring these, declaring what you want. And, you know, for me, sometimes personally, that is a little nerve wracking. I get, you know, a little, uncomfortable there, there's a little little fear factor there just because you know i'm saying something that i want and you know, i might not get it you know like i'm putting myself out there in in a way but you know have have developed a in my opinion like a beautiful manifestation practice that is really revolved around just you know declaring things and putting them out either verbally saying them or, or writing them out and, and sharing them in in certain communities um and have seen incredible fruit from that so i just want to close our conversation a little bit by giving you that opportunity. If you have anything that you want to manifest and declare the world, let's do it. I'm here for it. Yeah. So I think the next, um, evolution of, of me is, um, writing books to be an author. Um, I've got four or five books lined up that I'm ready to write. I've always written copywriting. I've even ghost this year. I ghost, I've ghost written three books for clients. And, uh, I was like, Oh, this is actually kind of fun, but I'd never done it for myself because of the, a lot of the stuff we've talked about, the fear, the self-worth, all these things. And now that all of that has kind of started to dissolve and I won't, I'm not going to say it's completely gone. It's, you know, stuff still comes up and it comes up in layers and things like that. But the difference between, who I was even six months ago, a year ago and five years ago, like those three leaps have been just exponential. So I'm finally in a place where I'm like, I'm ready to put my voice out into the world and not be hiding behind other people and doing, you know, doing that kind of work where I'm kind of the guy behind the curtain where I'm actually putting my voice and my, my big, beautiful brain, as my facilitator said, uh, out into the world along with my heart. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a new book right now and, uh, it'll be self-published. So that'll be out in the next month, the first one. Um, and I've got four or five planned. A couple of them could be combined. I just got to see how it turns out, but I plan on doing at least four books in the next six months to a year. That's incredible. Yeah. So I'm excited about Congratulations. that. Congratulations. Yeah. And, uh, from there, I'm hoping to turn that into kind of a thought leadership consulting type stuff. Um, it's not all around this, but there's definitely going to be some of the, the spiritual breakthroughs that I've had, you know, are obviously going to come through in the writing. Like that's, you can't, you know, this is now part of who I am. So it's some of that's going to come through how much of the stories come through. Um, uh, I don't know yet because I am going to be targeting the corporate market. So, <laughs> uh, 
we'll see if they find this this podcast or not but if they do they do amazing yeah and thanks for that well i'm gonna stand with you i manifest and i pray that sean as the author and that identity just starts to to grow and, and mold on you and that you know, manifest that your voice and your heart is going to be heard and, and that you'll, that you'll make those amazing connections that whoever needs to hear is going to hear. Um, and that you just manifest blessings and abundance and prosperity around your first book more so that this becomes a platform for you to grow and, and to make those connections and to just see this as a, as a jumping off point for you and in, in the next chapters of your, of your journey. I will receive that. <laughs> Hell yeah. I'll receive that. Sean, I have immense gratitude uh, as I do for, for anyone who comes on here and, and shares their heart and their vulnerability. I have immense gratitude for, for you and, and your experiences and, and your humanity and, and, you know, being a part of the, the reality sandwich community and, and, you know, ultimately challenging yourself every day and, and the things that life puts a, puts in front of you and, really getting up and being, being you every day, you know, for, for everybody that is the challenge we all face and appreciate you, appreciate you taking that on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's good to practice and to say these stories out loud and, and to um, reflect on the journey. Uh, I'm trying to do that more often uh, for awareness, just like you guys are doing and just for my own, to remember how far I've come because it's amazing how quickly you could forget where you were just, you know, a few years ago, you know? Uh, so, so yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to let me say it out loud. Absolutely. Um, and then for, uh, for the folks listening all the way to the end, um, and we'll have this in show notes, but, uh, where can, uh, where can everyone find you on podcast to tune more into, to Sean, uh, Sean McCool. Yeah. Um, I've been kind of behind the scenes so long. Uh, I'm going to be redoing my website. So I'll just give that. It's going to be Sean McCool.com S E A N M C C O O L.com. Um, if you just happen to be into marketing, persuasion, sales, that kind of stuff, I do have a podcast called persuasion by the pint that me and a buddy do, where we talk about all that stuff while drinking craft beer, which is kind of a fun show. <laughs> um, we like to say we, uh, we get to write off beer on our taxes. So that's our, that's our way to stick it to the man, I guess. But, um, so yeah, if, if there's a Venn diagram that overlaps psychedelics and marketing, um, then persuasion by the pint might be up your alley. If you're listening to this. Awesome. And then, uh, when your book comes out, we'll, uh, yeah. definitely share that with I'll the audience. Your, yeah, I'll definitely send you a copy. Channels. I'll let you know when it's available. Awesome. Well, congrats, man, again. Appreciate your time today and uh, we'll, we'll definitely stay, stay in touch and stay connected and, you know, I'll be, be praying for you over here for the, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future um, with what we've talked about. And if you ever need anything, definitely reach out and touch base. We're here for you. All right. Sounds good. I appreciate it.